Kia ora everyone and welcome to our Goodfellow webinar on Is It My Thyroid Doctor? My name is Dr. Courtney White and tonight we'll hear from Dr. Pavathi Chandra. Pavathi is an endocrinologist working at Mid-Central DHB and an active member of the Australian and American Endocrine Society. And I will now hand over to Pavathi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Courtney. Um, kia ora everyone. Uh, many thanks for those of you who have joined me tonight for the webinar. Um, I'm hoping that you're all staying safe and sound to wherever you are tuning in from and in your little bubbles. Uh, some of you are out of your bubbles. So um, tonight's topic is titled, Is It My Thyroid Doctor? Now, that's a very common and challenging question that um, we face as endocrinologists and as general practitioners on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm sure you will all agree with me that it's a very tricky question to answer. So let's take a look at uh, when you can say it's your thyroid and when you can say it is not your thyroid. So I don't have any disclosures for this talk. So what we're gonna to learn today is about subclinical hypothyroidism. Um, we'll look at what the guidelines say um, and how do you approach a case. Then we'll unpick the underlying evidence with which these guidelines are based on, and particularly looking at how symptoms correlate with hypothyroidism and the biochemical variations in TSH. Then we look at the implications for adjusting age in TSH. And um, if we need to know anything about circadian rhythm changes in TSH, uh, like we see in the other endocrine function tests like ACTH, for example. Um, then we'll have a look at who gets thyroid function tests done in primary care and who gets started on levothyroxine. And lastly, uh, we'll look at the clinical relevance of measuring anti-thyroid peroxidase antibodies in the general population. So the definitions of subclinical hypothyroidism um, has been provided to us by a joint statement issued by the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists, the American Thyroid Association and the Endocrine Society, and they published an update in JCEM in 2014. Now, um, what we need to remember is subclinical hypothyroidism is first and foremost a biochemical diagnosis. So it's not a clinical diagnosis and it's defined as elevated TSH with normal total or free T4 and T3 levels. The overall prevalence is estimated to be about 4 to 10% 4 to in the general population and about 20% in women older than 60 years of age. There are many, many, many controversial issues regarding the screening, evaluation, complications, and management of subclinical hypothyroidism. And that's because these are consensus panels, discussions, and conclusions, try to making evidence-based recommendations. So they're not like the robust guidelines we see in some medical conditions where we get strong uh, meta-analysis and randomized controlled trials. So consensus happens when usually people don't know what to do. So a lot of people, uh, experts from all over the world get together and they start, um, they disagree with each other a lot and then finally they decide uh, on a consensus which they all hang by and they will tell you that this is what we've decided to do. Uh, the problem with that is we get many, many views and we're forced to sometimes take a middle view. So subclinical hypothyroidism is one of them. Um, the recommendations are the recommend against population-based screening for thyroid disease. And it's a very important point, and I completely agree that's insufficient evidence to justify screening the population. They recommend against routine treatment of patients with subclinical hypothyroidism with TSH levels between 4.5 to 10 mu per liter. Um, and they acknowledge that up to 20% of patients who are receiving levothyroxine therapy currently are overtreated. And this can be substantially improved through physician education programs. So what I'm going to present today, all the, all the, um, the, the literature and the studies are all um, coming from these guidelines. So let's talk about a case. So um, there's a 70 year old Eileen who comes to see her GP for a three month history of feeling tired and feeling depressed. She has a past medical history of hypertension, which is treated with amlodipine and hypercholesterolemia, which is treated with adrovastatin. Uh, on leading further questions, Eileen reports a gradual weight gain following the birth of a third child. Now I would like to um, ask you all to vote for a first call, our first poll question. Um, based on this short history, how likely do you think that Eileen is hypothyroid? And I'm hoping that the poll question will be available for you. So I just want you to have a go at it. Um, is it less likely, highly likely, or you're not sure? We'll probably give you about 
15 to 20 seconds to get the maximum votes. Okay, so that's really interesting. Very good. That makes, makes my job really easy. So um, the majority, the 50% of you think it's less likely that um, she's hypothyroid. Very good. So we close that and move on. Um, right. So the question what's really asking you is how do symptoms correlate with thyroid function? Um, so let's take a look at the Canara study, which was the uh, which is the most um, quoted and well-cited study, which is the basis of most of these guidelines. Um, so Canara uh, distributed a questionnaire to a large group of people. This is not as a colorado study, about 25,000 people in this study. Um, and they definitely de discriminated the people into euthyroid, subclinical hypothyroid, and overt hypothyroidism based on the TSHs. And may, the, the, most of the symptoms, they were, majority of symptoms they were looking at were dry skin, poor memory, fatigue, constipation, weight gain, and so on. Um, what they reported was that 40% of euthyroid people, so that those are people with normal thyroid function tests, had no symptoms of hypothyroidism. Now, when you work out the maths, you can see the vast majority of euthyroid people, that's about 60% of them, had one or two symptoms of hypothyroidism. And um, the interesting thing is the overlap between the three conditions is very striking. Um, there is considerable amount of overlap across the board between euthyroid subclinical and overt hypothyroidism. But when you go up on the symptoms uh, range, so to three or four symptoms, you can see there are many more people who are overtly hypothyroid being symptomatic. But again, um, as I said, there is still a considerable overlap between the three groups, um, essentially telling you that the symptoms of hypothyroidism are nonspecific, and they do not, unfortunately, help predict hypothyroidism. So Carl et al. looked at the specificity of hypothyroid symptoms in the elderly population, so more than 60 years of age, and uh, looked at the odds of predicting hypothyroidism based on a symptomatic score, and they were more disappointed. They found that there is absolutely no statistically significant odds of predicting hypothyroidism based on the symptoms. Um, even with eight plus symptoms, they were non-specific and non-statistically significant. So their conclusion was that non-specific symptoms are even more non-specific in older individuals. So if you are if you're elderly or if you, as you age, um, you are less and less likely to be hypothyroid. Now, it's very important uh, for all of us to know about the Pollock study. The Pollock study is, again, one of the uh, well-coded studies um, looking at thyroxine treatment based on symptoms. It's a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled crossover trial. So there were 25 participants in the um, study group who had symptoms of hypothyroidism, but they were actually normal uh, individuals. They were youth thyroid people, and there were 19 asymptomatic controls. So the participants were given thyroxine 100 micrograms or placebo to take once a day for 12 weeks. And after a washout period of six weeks, they were crossed over to the other arm. Um, psychological and physiological measures were assessed at baseline and on completion of each phase. Now, the conclusion of the study, which is interesting, is that thyroxine was found to be no more effective than placebo in improving cognitive function and psychological well-being in patients who are euthyroid. That means there is um, no point in treating um, a euthyroid individual who has normal thyroid function tests with levothyroxine. In fact, they found that those who were given levothyroxine tend to do badly compared to those who were, who were on placebo. And unsurprisingly, an increase in T3 levels were also noted in the participants. So we all agree that um, based on just based on the symptoms, Eileen is highly unlikely to be hypothyroid. But how likely do you think she's to have a thyroid function test ordered in primary care? So let's take a look at the uh, BOLD study, which is looking at who gets thyroid function tests done in uh, primary care, uh, published in the family practice in 2012. So this is known as a depth study or the depression and thyroid study. So they looked at TFTs, which has been ordered at the discretion of the GP to exclude thyroid dysfunction. And the subjects were asked to complete questionnaires. There was a general health questionnaire 12 to assess psychological distress. Um, you all know the patient health questionnaire nine, which determines depressive episodes and the thyroid symptomatology questionnaire, which goes high if you have more symptoms. And there were about 300 patients in the study. So interestingly, they found that those who were referred for thyroid function tests have higher rates of psychological stress. So if you present with symptoms of depression or anxiety, you are twice as likely to get a thyroid function test done in primary care compared to uh, the unselected general population. Um, they also um, established what we already know, um, that there is very poor correlation of symptoms and thyroid function tests. And they found that mild elevation of TSH 
may result in lethal thyroxine treatment. And there's a problem with that. That's uh, one of the issues is we assume that the symptoms are due to hypothyroidism and more dangerously, we, uh, we stop searching for an alternative explanation at that point. And that's a clinical reasoning problem. So we set our minds on something, we ignore everything else because we think we know the answer. But unfortunately what happens then is the thyroxine treatment we're offering the patients will fail to control their known thyroidal symptoms. And that's when uh, patients start looking up on the internet, they will look at what symptoms they should be having, and they will come and knock on the door um, and ask you to um, do more tests and give them more prescriptions for alternative therapy, etc. So, um, so we've seen that in elderly population, as you age, the symptoms are non-specific. So what if we used an age-appropriate or an age-adjusted TSH to try and classify these patients into subclinical euthyroid and hypothyroid? Will that work better? So Samuel Sattol looked at that, um, looked at the age-expected TSH. So they um, uh, tested quality of life, mood, and cognition um, in 193 patients. They were community-dwelling men. Um, and compare the baseline um, with a six year follow up data. The mean age at enrollment was 75 years. So, what they found was prior to adjusting for confounding variables, so these people had a lot of confounding variables, prior to adjusting for those variables, their TSH was found to be associated with depression. Okay. Uh, but after adjusting for these um, confounding factors like age and medications, et cetera, uh, all those symptoms which they previously had, um, was, which was associated with, C to, with, with a rise in TSH were not found to be ringing any alarm bells anymore. So there was no significant association found with TSH or T4. And um, interestingly, after five to eight years, there was no change found in their quality of life, mood or cognition. So if they were um, hypothyroid to begin with, then um, you would expect them to deteriorate, but they didn't. So that means um, using an uh, appropriate TSH, um, mainly adjusting for age, um, may be a good idea to try and classify these patients and it might be very uh, much more clinically relevant as well. So we've um, seen uh, that, um, yes, um, because Eileen presented with feeling of depression, she's very likely, twice as likely to have her thyroid function test ordered. So um, we get a thyroid function for Eileen. Uh, the TSH comes back as 5.9 ME per liter. Now, uh, our lab reference range of TSH is 0.27 to 4.2. Um, so obviously this is outside the reference range. Um, so we get the um, abnormal result in red letters. Now, if you haven't seen the red letter, they will give you an asterisk next to it. And if you haven't seen an asterisk, they will um, put a little comment very helpfully next to it saying that this is abnormal and is consistent with subclinical hypothyroidism. Now, Eileen here has access to her results. She's seen the results, she's seen the red letters and they're coming from the lab and she's now demanding you to prescribe her levothyroxine for her symptoms. So that brings us to, your, uh, to our next poll question. Um, what would you do in this situation? Would you um, reassure her, Eileen? Would you consider starting her a small dose of, a dose of levothyroxine for her symptoms of depression? Would you repeat a TSH or would you consider checking her T4, free T4 and T3? Give you about 15 to 20 seconds. You can see there are 300 or more participants. So I would like to like everyone to have a go at that. Okay, that's that's really a good answer. Uh, so we'll go through um, the answers um, uh, in detail. Um, yes, I think um, I wouldn't be. Um, it wouldn't be too wrong if you if you reassure Eileen at this stage. Um, and I'm glad to see that not many of you want to start her on a trial of levothyroxine because we've learned from the Pollock study. Um, and uh, recently that if you use an age expected TSH, this probably uh, is not that abnormal uh, for Eileen. Um, the correct answer I would say is repeat the TSH uh, because one TSH doesn't really tell you anything. And if you see an abnormal result, you're bound to, uh, you, you have an obligation to repeat it to see if it's deteriorating or not. Um, Yes, you would want to check a free T4, but I would not check a free a T3. And that's something which we will get into in a bit more detail. So that's why I don't think that's the right answer. Um, in our labs, we usually get a free T4 if the TSH is abnormal, that's done automatically. And I'm pretty sure that's the same with the majority of the labs. So, um, okay. So, um, yes, yeah, so the question really is, is this enough information to start treatment? Um, or um, let's take a look at who or what type of patients get started on levothyroxine in primary care. 
the Taylor study is again one of the uh, very popular studies and very well cited study published in 2014 in the JAMA, uh, looking at treatment by TSH range. So this study had 52,298 subjects who were receiving levothyroxine treatment from 2001 to 2009. Um, they excluded those who really needed levothyroxine, for example, those who had a total thyroidectomy or uh, radioactive iodine or, and, and so on and so forth. They looked at uh, the, the subjects TSH pre levothyroxine treatment initiation and after five years of treatment. And the results show that nearly 10% of those who were treated with levothyroxine had a TSH of less than or equal to four at the time of presentation. Now, um, that's normal. So that means 10% of those um, were treated purely based on their symptoms. And again, we've seen from the Pollock study that these people tend to do badly. Uh, the median TSH at treatment initiation declined from about 8.6 in 2001 to about 7.8 7 in 2009. So showing a downward trend. The rate of levothyroxine prescribing almost doubled from 12 per 10,000 um, to um, 23 per 10,000 over the same time period. So if you were selling levothyroxine, this is really good news for you because you've just doubled your business. Due to the asterisk of the abnormal value, which is very unhelpfully reported by the lab sometimes, uh, more and more people were being treated for lower and lower TSH values, so-called asterisks. Okay. Um, they also found out that about 2.7% of patients still had a TSH of more than 10 after five years of initiation of levothyroxine therapy. That means we failed to control these patients biochemically. About 35% of people that prescribed uh, who were prescribed levothyroxine with a TSH of four to 10, had only one abnormal TSH before initiation of therapy. So that's really, um, really what um, the message is. You definitely need more than one TSH before you diagnose subclinical hypothyroidism, uh, particularly in elderly patients. Now, this is the more dangerous result. So approximately 6% of patients had suppressed TSH of less than 0 0.1 MB per liter. And we know that even low TSH um, and more uh, importantly, suppressed TSH levels are associated with um, cardiotoxicity, um, with increased risk of atrial fibrillation, strokes, osteoporosis and fractures, particularly those who are older than 60 years of age. So, um, so Eileen here, based on the Taylor study, there is a likely chance that she could be put on levothyroxine for her symptoms of depression based on one TSH alone. But the question is, is one abnormal TSH enough? Or how reproducible are TFT abnormalities? So for example, if you were going to do them again, will you get a 5.9 or will you get a different result? Let's take a look at that. So Huber study looked at the natural history of elevated TSH, a single elevated TSH in a normal T4. Uh, so this is a 10 year follow-up study. Um, they uh, grouped the people in, based on the TSH to uh, a group of people with a TSH of four to six, between six to 12 and more than 12. And they found out that about 1% of those who had a TSH of four to six progressed to overt hypothyroidism within 10 years. So that means 99% of these people did not progress or normalized. Some of them actually normalized their TFTs. If your TSH is between six and 12, then you have a slightly higher risk of progressing to overt hypothyroidism up to 40%. But again, if you look at the progression rate per year, it's about 5.6%. So that's very slow progression. So if you were to go and repeat a TFT, um, TSH and Eileen, you may not see any difference for another few years um, based on this data. And um, some of uh, we don't have a normalization data on that. If your TSH is more than 12, then you have a higher risk of 78% risk of progressing to overt hypothyroidism with a slightly faster rate of 11.4% per year. So that's, um, that's a really interesting um, study. So the, the basis of the, the key message from the study is the, it's, a, it's a initial TSH or the baseline TSH, which really um, um, predicts the rate of progression to overt hypothyroidism. So um, the key messages from some of these studies is that a single thyroid function test with an elevated TSH and a normal T4 can misclassify up to 40% of elderly people as having subclinical hypothyroidism. Therefore, we definitely require more than one set of TFTs to establish the diagnosis um, and it has to be repeated according to the guidelines about six monthly or uh, an yearly or if the TSH is quite high to begin with, maybe um, sooner than that. If the TSH values are more than 10, so if you have a single TSH of more than 10, that increases the risk of diagnosing and labeling someone with persistent subclinical hypothyroidism, uh, diagnosing overt hypothyroidism and the risk of initiation of levothyroxine treatment. Okay, so um, we got to repeat 
because that's what we decided that we will do. So we get a repeat here such a month later and at 6.2 mU per liter, so slightly higher. And this time it was done at eight o'clock in the morning. We have a free T4 of 13.1, which is normal uh, according to our lab uh, data and T3 is 3.2 picomoles per liter, which is noted to be low normal by the GP. And uh, again, coming back in red letters showing that this is abnormal. So the question is, are these values really abnormal? What do you think? So let's take a look at um, where, we got, where we get our reference ranges from. So where does this reference range of 0 0.27 to 4.2, or more commonly we see 0 0.4 to 4.1 mU per liter come from? So this comes from the National Health and Nutritional Examination Survey, or the NHANES 3 study, which is the largest of the uh, study, which gives us most robust data determining TSH reference range. So they analyze the median, and the lower and upper reference limits of TSH in um, youth or individuals using current immunoassays. Um, and the key conclusions from the study is that, unfortunately, it's not possible to accurately establish a TSH upper limit. Okay, and the overall reference range deemed to be between 0 0.4 to 4.1, but there were significant differences between age group and races. Uh, so, for example, if, uh, if you're a black male, you have a slightly lower upper limit of TSH compared to your white counterpart. And if you look at the age group, we've already seen uh, that um, age has a role to play in the reference range of TSH. If you're more than 80, then your upper limit of reference range comes under, um, it falls at 7.49 mU per liter. Uh, whereas in, you, in a 20 to 29 year old, it's 3.56 mU per liter. So for Eileen, um, who is 70, uh, a TSH of 5.9 to 6.2 perhaps falls within the expected reference range for her age. So it shouldn't really ring any alarm bells at that stage. Whereas if it was in a 20 year old, it might be a significant result that you may want to follow through. So the bottom line is not all elevations of TSH can be considered as hypothyroidism or it's not equal to hypothyroidism. Now, um, this is again a very, very interesting study. So looking at the longitudinal changes in TSH, what happens to your TSH as you age by wearing it all um, from 2012? So uh, it's a 13 year follow-up of very old patients. So they are about 85 um, and they check the baseline TSH pre T4 and total T3 and just measured them after 13 years. So they found out that there is a 13% increase in TSH. So these are youth or individuals who do not have any um, um, they don't have any thyroid dysfunction. They're not only with thyroxine. And where does that 13% increase in TSH come from? It's not definitely coming from the T4. As you can see, there is a 1.7% increase in T4, which is negligible, so not significant at all. Um, but that 13% increase in TSH has been beautifully shown to be correlated with a 13% reduction in your total T3. Now, what happens when you age? Um, when you age, there is a fall in T3. That's a natural phenomenon. And that's due to a fall in your deiodinase activity. So as you all know, deiodinase is an enzyme which um, helps convert um, T4 to T3 in the, peripheral, in the peripheral circulation. So if there is a fall in deiodinase activity, there will be a fall in T3 and there will be a rise in TSH correspondingly. Um, and that is um, hypothesized to be a, a natural uh, adaptive response to aging in the elderly population. Because in some uh, studies, for example, the Leyden 85 study, they've shown that this could be a protective effect in the elderly, um, a protective mechanism to prevent them from um, developing cardiovascular complications, for example, like atrial fibrillation. So this is, a, this, is a, this is like a natural phenomenon. And, the, and, and I don't know why we measure T3 or why we ask for T3 when you are um, suspecting hypothyroidism. Uh, but if you do, then don't be surprised to see a low T3 or slightly low normal T3. And that's because of a fall in deiodinase activity with aging. Okay, so we've seen um, a repeat TSH and we still think that's perhaps in the normal uh, limit for her age. Um, but is there good evidence of TSH deterioration? Does timing of the TFTs matter? So is it because uh, she actually deteriorated in her thyroid function when we had a uh, month later a TSH of 6.2? Or is it because the first one is done at 4 p.m. and the second one was done at 8 a.m.? So are there circadian rhythm changes in TSH that we should be aware of? So, um, so we'll take a look at this one. Uh, this is a circadian uh, TSH reference intervals study in women, and they grouped them into two age groups. Uh, they found that, that 60, there was a 61% increase in your TSH levels between um, the age group 61 to 80. 
with a peak at midnight and deer at lunchtime. And in 80 plus, you can see the TSH, are, uh, TSH levels are really high um, because they are uh, elderly. There's a 32% increase in their TSHs, uh, peaking at 2 a.m. and in Madeira at 2 p.m. So there may be um, circadian rhythm changes that we should be aware of, um, like we see in ACTH, cortisol, uh, LH, FSH, testosterone, all of those hormones, we tend to ask for a 9 a.m. sample. So that could be a similar phenomenon in TSH as well. So um, this is another more clinically relevant study um, looking at TSH of individuals measuring at 8 to 9 a.m. and they measured the TSH of the same individuals between 2 to 4 p.m. And they demonstrated that there is a 35% reduction in TSH levels if you do them in the afternoon. And these are patients who were not on thyroxine. When they looked at the patients who were on thyroxine, uh, there was a 32% reduction. So not much difference. Uh, so there, overall, there is a 32 to 35% reduction in TSH. So if you have an abnormal result and you want to normalize it, you better do them in the afternoon just before your practice closes. That will give you a lower result. So if you ask my opinion of Eileen, um, what would I think about um, um, Eileen's thyroid function test? So I hope we all agree that given the mild elevation of TSH, the probability of normalization of TSH during follow-up period is quite high. She has a 1% risk or maybe 0 to 1% risk of developing overt hypothyroidism, which is quite small. If her T4 levels decline over time, then I would consider treatment, once again, depending on patient's preferences after going through all the risks and benefits with the patient. That's because there is unclear data at the moment to say there is an improvement in quality of life after treatment of levothyroxine in people with subclinical hypothyroidism whose TSH is less than 10. And therefore, and, and also there is lack of data to show that um, levothyroxine reduces cardiovascular risk and risk of cognitive decline in patients with subclinical hypothyroidism. Therefore, we should always um, weigh the benefits of therapy against any potential risks of even a small degree of overtreatment, which can be quite disastrous for patients like Eileen because of the increased cardiotoxicity and, and skeletal toxicity. So, so my first summary is patients with non-specific symptoms get thyroid function tests. And that's okay. And that's what the guidelines ask us to do. There's no way we can predict hypothyroidism. But when you do them, when you do request CFTs, we need to bear in mind that there is very poor correlation of symptoms and thyroid function tests. And that can be very confusing sometimes. A single elevation of TSH is not equal to hypothyroidism. And we must always, always try to repeat a TSH. Uh, but we're not exactly sure how often or how frequently we should be looking at them. Many patients without hypothyroidism get levothyroxine treatment, and that's not okay. And that's what we learned from the Pollock study that people um, who are youth are tend to do badly if they're given thyroxine. TSH we've seen increases as T3 decreases with aging, and that's due to fall in deadenase activity, and that's a natural adaptive mechanism to senility. We've seen that circadian rhythm can account for TSH changes, so if you need a lower TSH, you do them in the afternoon. If you need a higher TSH, you do them in the morning. Uh, and last but not the least, there are many, many non-thyroid causes of symptoms that we should be aware of, which can mimic symptoms of hypothyroidism. So very um, quick look at those. Um, this is also um, adapted from the, um, the, the joint statement between the American and the British Thyroid Association guidelines. Um, so you can see there are many autoimmune conditions, um, celiac disease, adrenal insufficiency and pernicious anemia. Multiple myeloma is, is a highly underdiagnosed um, condition. There are many nutritional deficiencies, which is very tricky to diagnose sometimes, especially when you don't have access to requesting some of these tests like vitamin D. Um, obesity itself can cause symptoms of depression and dry skin and cold intolerance. Um, there are a whole host of lifestyle factors, poor sleep and exhaustion, and others like um, obstetric sleep apnea and post-viral syndrome. I think you might be seeing a, a few uh, long COVID cases in your practice in the next coming months. Um, that's one of the um, post-viral syndromes that can mimic symptoms of hypothyroidism. Um, the list goes on, and there are a lot, a lot of um, uh, other conditions like endocrine damage of various degrees, malignancy, connective tissue disorders like vasculitis in Italy, um, lots of drugs, and um, there are you know vast majority of patients who are on beta blockers and benzodiazepines, um, and others like uh, psychological conditions like depression, anxiety, etc. So I know it's difficult to um, 
open up a conversation when you have an abnormal result um, about their psychogenic condition or psychogenic factors causing symptoms. Uh, and sometimes patients can become quite combative um, and they always um, stick to their race GSH being an abnormality. But by the end of the day, uh, patients deserve to be diagnosed with the right condition. Okay, so, let, so I'll just pause there um, and take some questions uh, at this point before I move into the next session. All right, thank you. So we'll pause halfway then for a couple of questions. Um, aside from the timing of the sample, is there anything else that can affect TFTs? Oh, there are there are a whole host of things which can affect your thyroid function, um, particularly um, the medications. Um, are, and I think um, since the start of COVID, people have been very much aware of their immune status. They've been buying vitamin C over the counter, zinc over the counter, lots of supplements. So all of these um, supplements, um, particularly vitamin C, calcium, um, phosphate binders, aluminium, biotin. Biotin has been one of the other medications that's been seen to affect your thyroid function test quite a bit. Um, and there are other things um, um, to look at, for example, um, if they have um, heterophil antibodies or uh, anti-animal antibodies. So it's always good to cross-check if you're not too sure with another lab. So that's what we routinely do. Um, so we send an, uh, a, a, another sample to the Canterbury lab to have a look at that because they have a different assay. So assay interference is another thing which we all should be aware of, yes. And some of the newer agents, so I think some of um, some patients are now on uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors like sunitinib, um, which is another uh, well-known drug these days which can affect your thyroid. Yeah. Sure. Um, and does the timing of medication affect the thyroid levels as well? Absolutely, absolutely. So um, when you prescribe levothyroxine, I think it's uh, very important to have a good conversation with the patient about how you take, how the patients should take them. Um, thyroxine likes um, an acidic pH, so you must always uh, encourage patients to take them in the fasting state and avoid all the other medications and food for three hours. Now, it's a bit tricky in the morning, so especially when people are doing shift work, etc. There is, um, I know traditionally we say it should be taken in a fasting state first thing in the morning, but there is absolutely no problem with taking it at night if you cannot do it in the morning, just to give that three to four hours gap between food um, is fine. And we've got a couple of questions. I, see, I think you said we're, we're not too sure, but um, what would be your suggested time frame between taking thyroid tests, for example, for a patient like Eileen? Um, if I am going to start Eileen on thyroxine, which I don't think I will. Um, <laughs> so uh, we, we the question, uh, I didn't quite understand the question, is it about the TSH level or? Yeah, so if you had that a TSH level kind of like Eileen, at what point would you retest it, like eight weeks or what kind of time frame would you leave? Um, no, for Eileen, as I said, um, it, it, I, I'm pretty convinced that she's got a 1% risk of developing over hypothyroidism in the next 10 years, according to a large, large studies. So, um, I would um, certainly repeat it, but I would probably repeat it in six months time, unless there is a clinical indication to do it earlier. So if she does have true hypothyroidism, or if this is an onset of a true overt hypothyroidism, then she would deteriorate. Her symptoms of depression and her symptoms of tiredness and fatigue and everything will deteriorate and you will see more symptoms of hypothyroidism in the next coming months. So it's always um, good to keep a track of that. But um, I wouldn't be um, keen to repeat it any earlier than six months at least, yeah. Sure. Um, someone has asked about thyroid antibodies, but I think you might be covering That's that. That's my next session, a whole talk okay, on that. We'll leave that <laughs> um, some questions about uh, different supplements or treatment for thyroid, like ashwagandha, or we mm -hmm. GPs often get a few questions about whole thyroid that has the T3 as well. What are your thoughts? Um, so how, how do I approach that? Um, so what I tend to, um, again, it's a very difficult discussion that sometimes we have to have with the patients. Um, there are no major guidelines which support the use of any other preparations other than levothyroxine. Because levothyroxine is a, an excellent um, drug. It's an excellent medication. It's got a very good side effect profile. It's easily absorbed and it's the first line treatment. Um, so I follow guidelines and I do not endorse any other preparations for hypothyroidism. And especially with the thyroid extracts, the issue is we do not really know what the contents are. So most of, um, some, of the, some of the thyroid extracts are known to have um, steroids in it, 
then on to have T3 in it. So you are um, you're you are actually um, giving a drug which you are not familiar with. You do not really know the contents of it. It's not approved, and it's an ethical obligation from your side not to give um, any of those um, unproven and untested drugs for um, hypothyroidism. But we have an excellent choice. Sure. Uh, we'll take a couple more before we um, do the second half of your presentation. Um, and someone who, like an older adult, who um, someone's thinking about stopping thyroxin, do you need to titrate it down if they feel, for example, they want to stop it if it's not appropriate for them, they feel it might not be appropriate? Right. So I think this is about deprescribing. Um, mm -hmm. So we do uh, encourage um, people to deprescribe levothyroxine. It's one of the um, main drugs in the polypharmacy. Um, so um, it all depends on the dose and duration of uh, levothyroxine. So if the patient has been on 125 micrograms of levothyroxine for the last 10 years, you're very unlikely to get them off thyroxine even if you taper it in down, uh, because they're most likely um, have a suppressed um, and dormant um, thyrotrops and uh, the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis is almost dormant and they're never going to recover. So I wouldn't um, recommend you do that if they are on a high dose for a long time. But if you just started someone on 50 micrograms of levothyroxin three weeks ago, there is absolutely nothing stopping you from just stopping it straight away. So it's just a little bit of logic and a bit of common sense when you try to do that. I think if you are making someone recover from their hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis, you may want to do it sort of gradually, um, in, particularly in the elderly population with their, with their consent. I think patients are usually quite keen to do that. All right, and is there any place for a patient increasing their iodine consumption if they have subclinical hypothyroid? Mm. Yeah, so that's a very interesting question. Um, so iodine deficiency has been uh, a, an issue in New Zealand, I think, at least until 2009. So in 2009, um, there was a policy to um, fortify, so they endorsed uh, fortification of bread with iodine. And since then, um, they have um, the data has shown a, a, a dramatic improvement in iodine consumption in, in um, New Zealand population. So I do not think that we have a, a lot of people who are now iodine deficient. Um, so they've, what they found out is that uh, there is adequate iodine in, um, uh, in all males, males of all ethnicity, and uh, in Maori and Pacifica women. Uh, but there is still a, some iodine deficiency, I think, um, around in, in the New Zealand European women. Uh, but again, um, in the elderly population, if they are having a balanced diet. So it's, I mean, it's part of the part of the consultation to have a nutritional history. And if they're having a, a balanced diet, they're buying bread, they're eating um, dairy products and seafood, etc. They shouldn't, there shouldn't be an issue with iodine deficiency. It's not that, um, that much of a, a, a cause for primary hypothyroidism. The predominant cause is Hashimoto's thyroiditis or autoimmune hypothyroidism. Um, so I wouldn't, um, the problem with the iodine is if you start them, someone on iodine, then you need to monitor that. And we don't have a, a robust, um, uh, assay to look at their iodine levels. So I wouldn't recommend as a first line to supplement iodine in anyone, except when they are pregnant. So pregnancy still um, needs um, you know, iodine as, as a supplementation regularly. Okay, excellent. I think we'll leave the questions there just for now and let you carry on. Right, so um, I was um, hoping some questions from pregnancy, uh, which hasn't come up yet, so I'll leave that for now. And then we'll move on to the next session, which is uh, looking at the clinical relevance of measuring anti-TPO antibodies or anti thyroperoxidase antibodies. So I'm just gonna start with a poll question there. Um, so I'm gonna give you a statement. Anti-TPO antibody levels, change management. What do you think, true or false, or you're not sure? Okay. That's a really good spread. Okay, so do stay tuned in for the rest of the talk. It's really relevant. Okay, so I can um, I can totally understand why some of you have said uh, yes, it changes management, and that's because in patients like Eileen who has subclinical hypothyroidism with a mildly raised TSH, um, looking at their T looking at your TPO antibodies if they are elevated, um, you are encouraged to prescribe her levothyroxine more than if they are negative. OK, and I'm just going to talk about a few things which might change your mind. So, subcl so subclinical hypothyroidism, as we've seen, um, high TSH patients are at a risk of future hypothyroidism. So we've seen that in the Hebert study, um, that's, um, that there is a natural progression of high TSH um, in some patients between a TSH of 6 and 12 or more than 12. But that's regardless of their antibody status. So the baseline TSH or the initial TSH is the highest risk or highest predictor 
for um, progression to overt hypothyroidism compared to their antibody status. That's what the Huber study showed. Um, some people we know will not progress. Um, and uh, the other thing is, um, there is the anti-TPO antibodies or otherwise known as anti-microsomal antibodies are highly prevalent in a general population. So there are some, some studies showing up to 20% of people being positive for anti-TPO antibodies. So my bias is there is no indication for measuring them. Um, all you can do is if you have a patient with a borderline TSH, you can only do a repeat TSH, say in six months time or three years or symptomatically. So let's take a look at this referral. So this is a referral um, that I um, uh, tried last month um, addressed to us um, uh, from a GP. So thank you for seeing Sharon. Sharon is 35 years of age. She has been suffering from fatigue, joint and muscle pains and nausea. Her blood tests, including thyroid function tests are reassuring, that means they're normal, but her thyroid antibodies are elevated. So the TPO antibodies are elevated and there is a strong problem in the history of Graves' disease. Um, so they did an ultrasound scan of the thyroid and they and it showed some multinodal acoita and they think she may need an FNA. Um, and the GP's wondering about trying her on a low dose of levothyroxine. And do you have any other suggestions? So I would like you to all think about Sharon Sharon is 35, she's not pregnant, I'm just deliberately putting it there. Um, she does not have, uh, she has uh, some non-specific symptoms and she has elevated anti-TPO antibodies and normal thyroid function tests. So what would you do or what would you consider? Would you reassure Sharon at that stage? Would you consider repeating a TSH in three months? Would you repeat her anti-TPO antibodies in three months? Or would you um, start her on a small dose of levothyroxine now? So um, I would like you to all have a go with that question. Okay. That's good. Okay, so I'm very happy that only 1% of you want to start on levothyroxine. Uh, that's great. Now, let's take a look at um, um, the, the referral a bit more close, uh, closely. So, okay, so Sharon is 35. She's got some non-specific symptoms. And uh, it's very, um, it's absolutely okay for the GP to do some thyroid function tests and they are reassuring. That means they are normal. Okay, that's exactly where we should have stopped. But we proceeded a little bit further and did her thyroid peroxidase antibodies and they found to be elevated. Now, Sharon uh, may be suffering from anxiety symptoms that we don't know, or depression symptoms. And now we've given her a genuine reason to become anxious uh, by telling her that you've got an autoimmune condition. And um, I do not know the significance of this, but they elicited a family history of Graves' disease, which is probably not significant or relevant in her condition at all. Um, now, we should never have proceeded to do an ultrasound scan, but she did have one. And now uh, we found some um, nodules, which looks a bit suspicious, and she may need an FNI of that. And lastly, we're trying her on, or thinking about giving her a low dose of thyroxine. Now, again, I'm sure we've all learned now from the Pollock study that uh, we should not consider levothyroxine treatment in new thyroid individuals. So the answer to your question, to the question is, um, yes, we must, must, must reassure Sharon because her thyroid function test is normal. But um, uh, in addition to that, we should also be looking for other causes in Sharon's case. Now, there is no indication of repeated TSH in three months because it's absolutely normal now. So um, it's not subclinical hypothyroidism as the case with Arlene. So there is no real indication of repeated TSH. Um, and repeating a TPO in three months is also not three months is not also going to yield any positive results because TPO antibodies can vary a lot. So in elderly population, you get more positive TPO antibodies. If you're pregnant, you get more positive TPO antibodies. So it varies a lot. It disappears from your system. It appears again. So it doesn't really um, clinically serve a purpose. And as I said, we would not start levothyroxine. So where did this all start? Where did these antibodies come into the picture? So this all started in 1995 after the Wickham survey came out. Uh, it is a 20 year follow up of uh, positive anti TPO antibodies by Dr. Van der Pump. Um, and they followed up a lot of people who had positive anti TPO antibodies and negative anti TPO antibodies for a 20 year, a 20 -year follow up period. And they, um, the conclusion from that study is that the risk of hypothyroidism with borderline TSH, the borderline elevated TSH was 2.5% per annum in TPO negative individuals and 5% per annum in TPO positive individuals. So that got translated into a headline news, being antibody positive doubles your risk of future hypothyroidism. But um, completely forgetting the fact that the level of TSH, the initial TSH was the biggest risk. If you have a higher TSH, you're likely to progress. 
So let's take a, a, a clear look into these two categories from the Vanderpump study. Um, so if you're TPO positive, you have a 5% risk. That means 95% of you will not need levothyroxine in the next year. So the only management, therefore, in front of us is to repeat the thyroid function test at intervals. But what intervals are you going to do it every six months, every year, every other year? We, we don't really have an idea or clear idea. It probably depends on what the TSH level was to begin with. Um, if you're TPO negative, then you have a 2.5% risk. That means 97.5% of you will not need levothyroxine in the next year. So therefore, the only management is to repeat thyroid function test at certain intervals. But what intervals? Every six months, every year, every other year? We don't really know. So the bottom Bottom line is knowing the antibody status does not really alter the management at all. So coming back to Sharon now, so if um, we've established that we just need to reassure her and, um, and look for other causes, but now I'm going to throw pregnancy into the equation. What if um, the same referral comes through and tells us that Sharon is pregnant? So let's take a look at what happens to um, what happens in pregnancy. So we know from um, a long time ago, so from the from 2004 Promil study, that there is a clear association between the presence of thyroid antibodies and miscarriage. Okay, association, not causation. So this has been well known since then. There are many other studies which shows the same thing. And the conclusion from this study is that we need more randomized control trials um, to try and see if leothyroxine is the answer to these patients, these women. So um, this is the kind of the first study, uh, which is again, uh, was well quoted by guidelines, came out in 2006 by Negro et al um, in JCM. So they um, established again, what we already know from the Promel study that yes, youth are pregnant women who are positive for antibodies, has an increased risk of miscarriage and premature deliveries. And they also found out that giving them levothyroxine, actually they do a bit better and there is a reduction in miscarriage and premature delivery. The problem with this study is that it was not a blinded study, it was not a randomized control trial, it was, a, it was more like a prospective observational study. But based on the study, the American Thyroid Association guidelines in 2013 recommended that all pregnant women with TSH more than 2.5 mU per liter and a normal T4 who are positive for anti TPO antibodies be treated with levothyroxine. Then came 10 years later, um, in 2016, a negro study again, um, looking here at anti-TPO antibodies in miscarriage. This time, it's a proper randomized double-blinded study. We have a study group who are the TPO antibody positive women who get thyroxine in group A, uh, not to thyroxine in group B, and we have a control group who are TPO antibody negative. And the conclusion from the study is that levothyroxine intervention had no impact on miscarriage and preterm delivery in youth thyroid TPO antibody positive women. So um, same journal, same authors, but opposite outcomes. Now, based on this study, the 2017 guidelines changes again. There is now insufficient evidence exists to conclusively determine whether levothyroxine therapy is the answer. But however, administration of levothyroxine to TPO antibody positive youth thyroid women with the prior history of miscarriage, now they are bringing the high risk women. So if you have a prior history of miscarriage, then you can consider levothyroxine treatment due to the potential benefits that we know we don't know about yet um, in comparison with this minimal risk, okay? And then came the much anticipated um, tablet study, which has been equally looked uh, for by obstetricians and endocrinologists alike. Uh, it's the thyroid antibody levothyroxine study or the tablet study published in NEJM in 2019. Uh, this is a large study, a double-blinded placebo-controlled multi-center randomized trial. So everything that you would like to see in a study. Um, they recruited the high-risk youth thyroid women who had positive antibodies with a history of miscarriage or receiving treatment for self-fertility. They randomly assigned them, assigned them to receive um, either 50 micrograms of levothyroxine or placebo before conception and throughout the end of pregnancy. So this is the difference between this study and the Negro study. So the Negro study started the levothyroxine after uh, conception, and this one was even prior to conception. And looking at the primary outcome, which is live birth after at least 34 weeks of gestation. And you can see that the outcomes are very clear. There is absolutely no statistically significant difference between live pregnancy, viable pregnancies or live birth rate between the levothyroxine group and the placebo group. And in fact, they showed, they demonstrated there's, that there is a uh, slight increase. It's not statistically significant, but there has been an increase in serious adverse events in the levothyroxine group with some stillbirths and also um, in the order of preeclampsia and intrauterine growth retardation and so on and so forth. 
So the conclusion from this study is that levothyroxine should not be prescribed in TPO positive ER treatment for miscarriage or subfertility, as there is no benefit and there may be some potential harm that we didn't know about before. So the whole um, NEGRO study and the uh, tablet study raises a question about the relevance of checking anti-TPO antibodies in this population, because there is no effective treatment that actually works. And you might wonder why levothyroxine is not the answer. Now, there are some theories that have been postulated. They are just theories. There is no proof that none of them are proven yet. But um, one of them suggests that if you have positive anti-TPO antibodies, then you're more likely to have other antibodies. So for example, the anti-cardiolipin antibody or anti-phospholipid antibody, those antibodies which are more causally associated with miscarriage. So that's a possibility um, uh, and, and a possible explanation for this. Um, the other explanation is this is an immune mediated reaction. It's not, um, it's not um, a condition which causes hypothyroidism in these women to then cause miscarriage. So this is an antibody body mediated reaction um, uh, uh, between uh, the anti-TPO antibodies and the beta-HCG molecule in the zona pellucida. So that might explain why levothyroxine doesn't work in these women. So to summarize, there is, uh, I hope I've convinced you that there is no role for TPO antibody screening in general population as knowing the antibody status does not really alter management. TPO antibodies we know are associated with miscarriage. But unfortunately, there's no point in knowing this uh, because there is no genuine intervention that works. Levothyroxine is not the answer. Uh, therefore, levothyroxine should not be prescribed to TPO antibody positive women who um, had even a prior history of miscarriage subfertility, as there are no benefits and there may be potential harm. Okay, so I would like to um, end my talk by uh, paying acknowledgements and thanks to Professor Karim Miran, who has done uh, the majority of work on anti-TPO antibodies and published his um, work titled The Irrelevance of Measuring Anti-TPO Antibodies. And he claims that we should abolish the assay altogether because it's absolutely pointless in doing them. And I would also like to thank profusely Professor James Hennessy for uh, his work on subclinical hypothyroidism and um, most of the um, journals and talk, uh, studies that I uh, mentioned today are from his, um, from his guidelines. So um, I would take questions. Thank you very much. That was a great talk. Um, all right, a couple of questions. One person is asking, uh, how often do you see patients with true myxedema? Very, very rarely, very, very rarely. And I mean, those are the people who have slipped through multiple, multiple safety nets. So uh, there are many opportunities for people to be diagnosed with myxedema. To be honest, I do have an actual myxedema case in my ward right now as we speak, but that's after a long, long time that I've seen someone like that. And that's due to amiodarone. So someone who has been on amiodarone for, some, for a long, long time and had a normal TFTs um, a few months ago, but suddenly developed amiodarone induced hypothyroidism with a TSH of more than 100. So he presented with heart failure and he had all the features of myxedema. So this is a, a single case that I've not seen for probably about five, three or five years. Um, does the TSH, TSH range or the target TSH range differ um, for women trying to conceive and women who are pregnant? Um, yeah, so uh, that's why I said I was expecting some questions on pregnancy, so I can go <laughs> back and show you um, a couple of slides on that. So um, yeah, pregnancy is a, uh, is a different um, a topic and a, and a, a talk of its own. Um, that's because um, a lot of things happen during pregnancy uh, and your thyroid. So your thyroid changes a lot. So there's an increase in iodine excretion. There is an increase in thyroid binding globulin. There is an increased thyroid hormone production due to meet the, to meet the demands. And there is on top of that, the stimulatory effect of HCG. And uh, they all peak by week seven to week 16 and sort of stays high throughout the pregnancy. So that's uh, the, 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 because of that, during pregnancy, women usually have a lower serum TSH. Okay, so yes, the answer is yes, there is a lot of variations in your TSH during pregnancy and therefore the upper limit or the reference range that we are saying about so the 0 0.4 to 4.1 does not apply in pregnancy because there's a downward shift of both the upper and the lower limit in pregnancy 
Um, so just very quickly um, tell you what the guidelines say about um, subclinical hypothyroidism pregnancy. So wherever possible, it's really important that we use a trimester specific reference range um, that should be provided to you by your local laboratories uh, based on the local population um, reference ranges of the practice. Um, and that's what your guidance, um, uh, that's what your reference ranges should be for your uh, TSH levels. Um, there is no indication to screen pregnant women for thyroid abnormalities. That's, uh, that's a statement. And it's really important to remember, it does not justify screening in, um, in, preg in all pregnant women. But there is a role for serum TSH measurement in women who are seeking care for infertility as a weak recommendation. And the reason uh, is um, there is insufficient evidence to suggest that levothyroxine therapy improves your natural conception uh, risk or rate. Um, so um, the reason why we want to know about the TSH is because once pregnancy is confirmed, then you may want to think about giving them T4, thyroxine, to reduce their TSH to less than 2.5 in order to prevent progression to overt hypothyroidism in pregnancy and minimize the risk of miscarriage. And now that's also a weak recommendation. The only strong recommendation is if they are trying actively by undergoing IVF or ICSI, then they may have a role um, to treat them with levothyroxine to try and uh, give their TSH less than 2.5, which is the only strong recommendation in subclinical hypothyroidism. Okay. I hope that, uh, that answers the question. Uh, is it safe to give all pregnant women iodine, whether they're hypo or hyper or you can? No, so um, I wouldn't, so I will um, not recommend giving iodine supplementation to who are actively thyrotoxic um, and, and who are on active treatment or even subclinically thyrotoxic. So some of them have a lower TSH, but normal T4 and T3. Uh, even for those women, iodine can be um, a, a trigger for um, worsening the hypothyroidism. But for all other women, um, it is recommended for hypothyroid women as well. All right. Is there a role for checking T3 in younger patients? Um, not for hypothyroidism or subclinical hypothyroidism, because we don't really know um, now what are we going to do with it. So we don't have a clear idea about what the low T3 or a normal T3 tells us. And we know that T3 assays are not that great compared to the T4 assay or a TSH assay. Um, so um, the, the lack of data um, to interpret um, T3 is what stops me from checking it. Um, what's your advice around checking thyroglobulin antibodies? Okay, so yeah, no, I mean, uh, very, I, I forgot to mention that this is very much specific to TPO antibodies. And there are a lot, many other antibodies which are really, really useful. Uh, one of them is the antithyroglobulin antibody. Then uh, there is no point in checking it in a normal person because it's going to be elevated. Thyroglobulin is uh, produced by your, um, um, your thyroid. So you will have um, a uh, raised thyroglobulin levels and you will have some antibodies to it as well. Uh, that doesn't really uh, tell you anything. It's not clinical relevant, but it's really useful in a patient who had thyroid cancer, who had thyroid cancer treatment in the form of thyroidectomy and radioiodine afterwards. Um, it tells us the prognosis. It tells us um, uh, the chances of recurrence or it gives us an early warning of recurrence. Similar um, um, usefulness of TSH reception antibodies are really extremely useful in diagnosing Graves' disease um, because they are not uh, present in the general population. Yeah. Are there any uh, circumstances where testing anti-TPO would be helpful or would change um, management? It, uh, no, um, it wouldn't change management, but in trial settings, so if you're doing your research, um, because still we, we, we have a, as I said, this is consensus. There are a lot many experts still debating about the usefulness of anti-TPO antibodies. And if you are undertaking a trial or a research project, you may want to prove that, uh, if you want to prove that a patient does not have an underlying thyroid disease, then you may want to check it. Um, just for um, the purpose of the trial. Um, otherwise, there is no clinical relevance of doing it. Um, someone just wants to clarify uh, if someone's TSH was up and rising um, and their T4 started dropping at that point, would you then consider 
the yep. hypothyroid then. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. I mean, if the TSH goes above 10, even with a normal T4, and um, if you can, um, if, it's an, if it's a younger patient um, with, a, with minimal risks, then I would still think about giving them levothyroxine. Some studies have shown that TSH should be more than 20 to give you any, uh, any cardiovascular or, or cognitive risks um, due to the rising TSH. So it, it's a little bit variable, um, but uh, yeah, I think you can correlate your symptoms a bit better there. Um, is it worthwhile doing, uh, say, a TSH in a delirium screen? Um, again, that's um, slightly tricky. So um, if, it's, if it's an outpatient, um, certainly um, I think it's, it's really important to take the thyroid function test and because you can miss a lot of thyroid abnormalities in delirium. But in an inpatient setting, if you're coming with an infection or sepsis, you might want, you, you, you can do it. I think it's really important to do it, but you, you may want to interpret it with a lot of, bit of caution because you do get a lot of non-thyroidal illness um, sort of type of abnormalities in your TSH and your T4 and your T3 even. Um, so yes, definitely as part of the delirium screen. Um, how important is it to make sure patients stick to the same brand of levothyroxine? Um, so it is, um, it is important if a patient has been on the same brand for, say, 15 years, you don't really, and they've been on, uh, they, they've had stable thyroid function tests, there is no indication to, for a switch. Um, if you do have to switch for one reason or the other, suddenly the patient becomes allergic to a brand, um, you may want to be very cautious about um, checking their thyroid function test a little bit more frequently for the next few weeks to make sure um, the dosing is correct. Um, so there is um, no other indication. I think we've got about three brands in, the New, Ze in, in New Zealand. As far as they are, um, they are bioequivalent, the bio, um, the potency and the bioequivalence is, is approved by um, a, an authorized pharma company um, and the FDA, et cetera. Then uh, there is no reason to uh, worry about it. Yeah. But if you switch, you do need to make sure you test their thyroid function a bit more frequently. Um, is there any risk to newborns of mothers who are taking higher doses of levothyroxine, for example, the HPA? Hmm. Um, so, um, um, so the, the um, there is no um, actual risk to the fetus as far as the mother's thyroid function test is in the normal range. So um, if you if you have a pregnant woman who is on levothyroxine, then you are uh, going to check a thyroid function test once every four weeks during her during their pregnancy and to um, have that TSH specific reference ranges. If you are within that reference range, there is no increased risk of any um, any um, of any fetal thyrotoxicosis or anything like that. But if your mother is um, thyrotoxic with uh, Graves disease and they have positive TSH receptor antibodies, yes, there is a risk for the fetus to develop fetal thyrotoxicosis and they should be monitored very closely from uh, week 28, yeah, for, to assess that risk. Um, slight topic change. Um, would you be able to speak about sickly thyroid and what should primary care be mm. doing? Mm. Um, I mean, it's um, CQ thyroid is something which we commonly see in hospital, in inpatients, um, particularly in people who are in ICU setting. I wouldn't have expected CQ thyroid people to be um, ambulatory in our patients. Um, but so um, it, it, it is a, um, a situation when your thyroid is trying to meet the demands and try to um, actively support your organs and your metabolic function when you're really, really sick. So what you see in the beginning for sick thyroid syndrome is your T3 levels start to fall. And that's because um, there is an increased um, clearance of T3. So there is a more conversion to reverse T3 by your DRNAs3 enzyme. So you get a fall in T3, which is then followed by a fall in T4 and then eventually a fall in TSH. So you will get a result with a low TSH, low T4 and low T3. And then you're kind of confused, so this, is, this doesn't fit in. And that's usually a, a sign of CQ thyroid. But again, um, it's not something which I would diagnose in an ambulatory patient. And then during the recovery from the illness, uh, so mostly septic shock, um, we probably see that a lot in COVID cases as well. Um, you do see an improvement in your TSH first. So your TSH rises to normal, followed by your T4 and then eventually your T3. So if you do the test anywhere in between, you're gonna get a lot of confusing results. Um, but uh, the, the main um, uh, idea is if you do pick up an abnormality, it's important to make sure you test them again when they're recovered fully to, uh, to assure that they are 
uh, they're normalized by that. Um, what the fighter of antibodies change anything? For example, if they were over a thousand or very high. Mm, mm. So this is the thing. So anti anti TPO antibodies do their own thing. So yes, they change their titer. You check them again; it's high. Check them again; it's low. It just gives a lot of anxiety to the patients just to tell them about the titer. Some people are worried they've got Hashimoto's thyroiditis, um, even though they have normal thyroid function tests. So it just is merely anxiety generating. There is absolutely no. Uh, clinical relevance to it. And uh, they change, as I said, in pregnancy, they change when you're elderly. Um, it's just all over the place. Um, any thoughts on, um, I'm not sure if we covered this before, but ashwagandha. Um, it's not uncommon that patients come in and they've, yeah. you know, they've taken this. So, yeah. I think we covered that before, isn't it? So as I said, it's um, it's unproven and it's unsupported, any of these supplements. Um, so um, as doctors, we have a uh, ethical obligation to the patients not to prescribe them something like that. Yeah, yeah sure, okay. Um, someone asking if uh, there's a female in her 30s with slightly elevated T4 and slightly elevated TSH, um, what would be your recommendation? Um, yeah, so these are these are typical. These are typical patients who have um, assay interference or heterophil antibodies or anti-animal antibodies, who's in, which is interfering with their assays, which is the most common and most likely explanation. I do not believe these patients have tsotomas. Tsotomas are extremely, extremely rare. And um, you know they will have other symptoms of pituitary dysfunction. So my um, suggestion is exactly the same as before. If you are, if there are thyroid function tests which doesn't fit in with a clinical picture, repeat them first of all um, in a few weeks' time and um, check cross check with another lab which use a different assay. So for example, the Roche assay and the Abbott. So there are different assays in different uh, New Zealand labs. So just give it to another lab and um, you might see a different picture. But if there is persistent abnormality, then of course, consider an endocrine referral and maybe, uh, maybe it's a TSA trauma. Okay. All right, that actually wraps up all our, all our questions for this evening. Um, so a big thank you to Kavati for joining us today and such a great overview of um, hyperthyroidism. Um, thank you so much to everyone else for joining us tonight. And just a reminder that uh, this presentation will be online on the Goodfellow website tomorrow, uh, along with a list of any relevant resources. So thank you again, Pavati, for joining us. Um, and everyone have a lovely night and stay safe. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you.